We're live. Are we ready to begin? Just one second, Chair Baron. Okay. Recording to the PC, begin. Recording to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. And good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee on Higher Education. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair Barron. We are ready to begin. Uh, thank you. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our virtual oversight hearing on the topic of of the policy, admissions policy for CUNY Early College High Schools. I'm Council Member Inez Barron and a proud alum of CUNY. Thank you to everyone who is here to testify today. I especially want to thank the students from Hunter College High School the High School of American Studies and Macaulay Honors Program, whose activism and self-advocacy inspired today's hearing. These students have been organizing for the diverse, inclusive and equitable educational environments they deserve. And we should all be grateful for their commitment and contributions. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine the various admission policies at CUNY affiliated early college high schools, also known as early colleges. Early colleges are secondary schools that offer students the opportunity to earn both a high school diploma and an associate's degree or up to two years of transferable college credit at no cost to the student. Early college curriculum blends college prep and college level courses, making college education more accessible and attractive to students, and particularly to low income and students of color, groups historically underrepresented in higher education. These programs are premised on the idea that students who are traditionally the least likely to earn a post-secondary degree need early and engaging experiences with college. They reflect a broader institutional attempt to address the significant racial and economic disparities that exist in our public education system. On January 29th, more than 30 elected officials signed on to a letter from the speaker and I calling on the CUNY chancellor and Hunter College president to address concerns about racial and economic segregation at Hunter College High School. Despite Hunter College High School's mission to quote, reflect the city, end quote, by admitting and educating a quote, culturally, socioeconomically, and ethnically diverse, end quote, student population, the school's student body is less than 3% Black, about 6% Latinx, and 9% low income students. In comparison, the city's public school population is 66% Black and Latino and 73% low income. 
Yet the pool of New York City students scoring in the top 10% on both the state ELA and math tests is 27% Black and Latino and 47% low income. Based on this data, a sizable population of high achieving Black, Latino, and low income students are being screened out due to Hunter College High School's reliance on a single admission exam. As worrying as Hunter College High School's demographics are, racial and economic disparities are not isolated to just one school. The, city, the city's public school system, which, which is the largest in the country, and also has the unfortunate distinction of being one of the most segregated school systems. Moreover, the COVID-19 pandemic has only worsened the issue. issue. Black, Latino, and low-income students have disproportionately faced poor access to quality remote or in-person learning, family strain from unemployment and serious COVID health threats when compared to their white and better economically off peers. Hunter College High School chose to delay its entrance exam in response to the pandemic. In our letter, we asked CUNY and Hunter College to do more. This is the time to reform admission policies to better serve all the students in New York City. Our demands include one, suspend the Hunter College High School admission test this year in recognition of the serious equity impacts in the pandemic. Two, implement an alternative admission policy system for 2021 to admit, to admit a high achieving but more racially and economically diverse class that looks like New York City. And three, work with school integration experts to identify and adopt permanent change to the admission system that balances equity with excellence. Though these, though these demands were directed at Hunter College High School specifically, all CUNY affiliated high schools should strive to implement a pro-diversity admission system that forces an equitable, racially and economically diverse learning environment. Today's hearing will hopefully allow us to learn from a variety of admission models. I look forward to testimony from programs who have successfully maintained a diverse student population, as well as those that have struggled in this area. Before I conclude my opening remarks, I want to acknowledge that this is Black History Month. And in the spirit of celebrating the countless contributions of African-Americans who have made up our city and country, I'd like to take this time to acknowledge some notable Black alumni of Hunter College High School. Ruby Wallace D, class of 1939, an Oscar nominated actor, writer, and civil rights activist known for her roles in Do the Right Thing and Raising in the Sun. And just wanna say, I had the distinction of meeting her on several occasions and she and her husband were very gracious to do several book signings for young people on various occasions. And she also was offered herself as a part of the mass protests for the killing of Amadou Diallo. Ron H. Brown, the class of 1952. Mr. Brown was the first African-American appointed to the post of Secretary of Commerce in President Clinton's administration. And the Ron Brown Scholar Program was established in his honor to provide academic scholarships, service opportunities, and leadership experiences for young African-Americans. Now, in preparing for this hearing, I would like to thank Joy Simmons, my Chief of Staff, M. Indigo Washington, my Director of Legislation and CUNY Liaison, Chloe Rivera, the, the Committee's Senior Policy Analyst, Michelle Peregrin, the Committee's Financial Analyst, and Frank Perez, the Committee's Community Engagement Representative. And I wanna offer a great welcome to Amy Briggs, the Committee's new counsel, who will be moderating her first hearing today. I would like to acknowledge the members of the committee that are here with us. I saw council member Alan Maisel, and we did have council member Brad Lander as well. As others join, I will acknowledge them. And at this time, we'll turn it back to our moderator.
Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the Committee on Higher Education for this. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair Barron. Uh, my name is Amy Briggs. As I was just introduced, this is my first hearing. Um, I am counsel to the Committee on Higher Education at the New York City Council, and I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Um, before we begin, please remember that everyone will be put on mute, and I'll call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. Uh, note that there will be a few seconds delay before you unmuted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will call up, on, call up individuals in panels. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. For today's hearing, we're going to begin with a panel of students, followed by testimony from the City University of New York. This panel will be followed by council member questions, and the second panel will include a representative from CUNY, followed by council member questions, and then public testimony. The first panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be Leonardo Vargas Sanchez, Chloe Rolick, Durga, Durga Srinivasan, Victoria Meng, Eliza Kubers Kuberska, and Aruna Das. I apologize for the pronunciations. I tried to put them out phonetically. phonetically. Um, so I will now call on Leonardo Vargas Sanchez to testify. Time starts now. Uh, my name is Leonardo Vargas Sanchez. I'm currently a junior at Hunter College High School, a CUNY Early College High School, which I was admitted to in seventh grade for passing the singular entrance exam. I'm also part of the 6.2% Latinx and 9% low income communities at Hunter, which is only a fraction compared to New York City's public school, 40.6% Latinx, 72.8% low income population. My experience at Hunter has been a long uphill battle in more ways than one, even before I entered the brick prison as, a, as an admitted student. As a sixth grader, I was considered gifted, but a lot of my peers who were also gifted wound up being pretty competitive about this part in Hunter getting tutored for it and paying money for test prep materials. I had none of those options available to me. Even on the day of the test, I was late due to train delays and took the test on a makeup day. Struggles due to class were there from even before I was a student at Hunter. Socially, I faced my fair share of microaggressions and assumptions based on race, especially early on in my Hunter career due to the 2016 election. Academically, I've always felt like there was a pressure put on me due to my socioeconomic status other people don't have. Most of Hunter's student population are well off enough to afford things like tutors outside of class, the preparation materials for college and the like. My inability to afford things like that has heavily hindered my performance at the school. Since there's not only a pressure to excel at the classes you do have, but to excel at extracurricul extracurriculars you partake in as well. I was a member of the track team at Hunter for a few years. While I was quite comfortable with the extra few hours it took to go to practice, the coaches usually had to buy equipment with money from their own pockets. This usually ended up with a few people at the very least not having the necessary equipment during the training or meets. Students were encouraged to pay for their own shoes and gloves, which usually cost them around $100 or so. Outside of track, my apartment was never one that was too conducive to study. The walls were thin, even for our neighbors, and there was always a risk of power outage. I've always been really busy when it comes to helping out around the house as well. So studying and doing homework mixed in with all of that wound up burning me out, either making me too tired to concentrate or forcing me to stay up until the early morning hours. Even then, there would still be work I'd be forced to do on the commute to school. Early on, my grades plummeted from what they were before I was admitted to the school, causing more conflict with my family, greater pressure, and even greater burnout. Even among the students, my grades were causing people to look down on me. There were multiple times when people questioned my position at the school, saying it was a fluke or that it should have been impossible that I got in. There were efforts made by the school early on to combat this imposter syndrome, the term they used to address it, but those efforts fell flat. 
This counselor led workshop stopping after seventh and eighth grade, many students would continue to judge people based on their academic success, influenced by their biases of socioeconomic backgrounds as a result of their environmental. I'm expired. While they might not consciously realize they're perpetuating harmful stereotypes, it exaggerates a culture unwelcoming to the BIPOC and low income student population. As senior year inches closer, the immense pressure and stress of attending an appropriate and prestigious four-year college is only becoming more prominent. And as a low-income student, that pressure is compounded. The elitism ingrained in haunted culture manifests in, the, in an expectation of attending an Ivy League or an impressive private college. The financial gains of having a college degree would come up with, along with getting scholarships just so low-income families won't have to bear the immense debt colleges give their students. Especially now, with everything going on with COVID, students' home circumstances make all the difference in their, work, in their work efficiency. Not only is a good internet connection necessary for attending classes and taking tests, but a student needs a good enough workspace, with enough room to work and enough solidarity to focus. The administration isn't providing these resources for low-income students or taking these concerns into consideration. With a more socioeconomically diverse student body, the administration would have to provide these resources as these issues would affect more students. In addition, the student body would be exposed to different experiences and a lot, of a lot of prejudices the upper class students have would be challenged and resources would be more widely available and general accessibility would be expanded while allowing students like me to feel like they can belong and they can succeed. Thank you for your testimony, Leonardo. Um, I will now call on Chloe Rolick. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Chloe Rollick. I'm a senior at Hunter and a co-president of both our Black and Latinx student organizations. I would like to preface my statement by saying how appreciative I am of the education I've received at Hunter. Both my teachers and classmates have contributed so much towards making me the lifelong learner I am today. But there is an equity crisis at Hunter and it has existed at our school for decades. As Chair Barron stated earlier, our student body is 2.4% Black, 6.2% Latinx, and 9% low income, demographics highly unrepresentative of our city's talent. These demographics, however, are not just numbers. Like Leo, my experience has been marred by feelings of isolation, affirmative action remarks, and the constant pressure to prove not only my own worthiness, but also the worthiness of those from my communities at schools like Hunter, at a school like Hunter. As a public school, we must create an environment that is conducive to everyone's education and well-being. And I strongly believe that neither can be achieved in a segregated high school. Hunter segregation can largely be attributed to our, our current admission system. Since the 70s, Hunter has had the same two-step admissions process. Students first qualify by the fifth grade state test or an equivalent, and then are admitted by our own homemade admissions test. Although the same admissions process brought in much more a much more diverse student body in the 70s and 80s, the heightened use of test prep in our city, among other things, has served to disadvantage low-income students and drastically alter our school's demographics. Unlike the SHSAT schools, which are bound by the state's hecht calandra law, our admissions process is completely decided upon by the Hunter College and CUNY administration. However, despite decades-long decades -long calls by community members to change our admissions system, the Hunter administration has taken no steps towards reform. In 2003 and 2010, faculty both in both years, faculty put together action items and recommendations to increase equity within our admissions process. Both efforts were discontinued after proposals were heavily rejected by our administration. Now in June of 2020, students came together to write a 27 page call for immediate change in our school's climate, curriculum, faculty diversity and admission system. Our document publicly challenged the Hunter community to reflect on the chasm between our stated institutional mission to reflect the city we serve and our reality of exclusion and systemic bias. Our letter received 1,895 signatures, leading Hunter to hire new faculty of color and summer curricular review and reform groups, yet admissions still did not change. Despite lacking support by our administration to change admissions, students formed HCHS for Diversity, an equity ad advocacy group, and worked with parents, alums, and teachers to research top admissions models across the country, connect with experts, and finally create proposals for short-term and long-term reform to the Hunter system. We shared these suggestions with the Hunter administration in mid-July, yet received no formal response. 
After hosting a protest of around 100 people in September calling for immediate suspension of the Hunter test for the pandemic year, we were finally able to meet with Hunter College President Jennifer Robb to discuss- Time expired. Yes, yeah, sorry. To discuss the dual health and equity crisis at hand. And this meeting, thank you. In this meeting, President Robb agreed to pay for an integration expert to do initial consult. Continue. Finish. After weeks of meeting with various experts, we found two consultants that graciously, graciously offered to work with Hunter immediately. However, despite proposing these two experts to the Hunter College administration and providing a scope of work on October 22nd, which can be found in our table of contents, number 18, we still have not received any tangible follow-up. And from what I've seen, Hunter has not announced its admissions process for 2021. As a public institution with a state admission to reflect the city we serve and serve as a model for combining excellence and equity, Hunter must do better. It has been nearly eight months since we initially called for change. And while our community has taken many strides to combat cultural and educational issues within our school, it is in the hands of the Hunter administration to take decisive action and rid our admission system of its exclusionary practices. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Chloe. I will now call on Durga Srinivasan. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Durga Srinivasan and I'm a senior at Hunter and president of our student government and one of the leaders of HCHS for diversity. Again, we are asking that the Hunter administration one, suspend its test this year, two, replace it with a pro-diversity alternative, and three, work with integration experts and students to create and commit to a permanent pro-diversity admission system for coming years. These demands are backed by the 884 community members who signed on to our November letter to the Hunter administration, as well as 37 New York elected officials and the letter to Jennifer Robb and Chancellor Felix Matos, spearheaded by council member Inez Barron, among others. We worked with integration experts to create proposals for admissions changes, recommended experts for them to consult with, and looked at models at other schools, which have shown us that real solutions are feasible including socioeconomic weighting to expand diversity, which is used in the Chicago exam high schools. And with the heightened equity emergency brought on by the pandemic, top schools like Th Thomas Jefferson, Boston Latin and Lowell High School are suspending their tests for this year and adopting interim pro-diversity alternatives. As you can see outlined through pages six through 28 of our submitted testimony, Many of our continued proposals and communications have received little to no response from the Hunter administration. We heard that an HCCS task force would be created by Hunter College at the end of August, along with the subcommittee for the campus schools. But the task force only met for the first time this February, five months later than promised. Some students involved with HCHS for Diversity were invited to, the, to join the task force. And while we are grateful to be on this new task force, we still have not been told that our aim is to attain a more diverse class of Hunter students. After the lack of response regarding the 2010 proposed changes to increase diversity through admissions, it is crucial that the administration make a commitment to adopting a long-term pro-diversity model. This long history of inaction at the administrative level is why Council Member Barron penned her letter along with 36 other elected officials, including Speaker Corey Johnson, asking for the commitment to change from Hunter College. Public advocate Jumani Williams wrote his own letter holding Hunter College accountable and demanding the administration reform admissions to expand diversity. Chancellor Felix Matos claims that CUNY is a, is a is an educational Ellis Island that provides a gateway to high quality, affordable education and an upward economic mobility to New Yorkers of all backgrounds on the homepage of the CUNY website. Why is our high school doing the same? We are here today to hold CUNY accountable to ensure that the first free public university in our nation upholds its mission statement and truly reflects the city they serve by admitting and, and educating- Time expired. You can sense. conclude your remarks. Thank you, council member. We are here today to hold CUNY accountable to ensure that the, free, the first free public university in our nation upholds its mission statement and truly reflects the city they serve by serving and admitting um, a population of students who are culturally, socioeconomically, and ethnically diverse. In the lack of diversity within Hunter College High School, CUNY fails to uphold this mission statement. 
In light of the pandemic, there's no time to spare in addressing the equity emergency at our school. Now that the task force has been created, it is crucial that the school is held accountable for making changes, remaining transparent, and, and ensuring that this year's admissions and the admissions for years to come are equitable. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Durga. I will now call on Victoria Meng. Time starts now. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Victoria Mung, and I am an alum of Hunter College High School. For the last eight years, I have also been an English teacher at Hunter, which means that I have been one of the graders of Hunter's entrance exam. For the last five years, I have also served as one member of the committee that writes the ELA sections of the entrance exam. So while I only represent my own opinions, I believe that my experiences as a former student and test taker, a current teacher and test writer, and a longtime member of the Hunter community can be relevant to today's topic. As a test writer and proctor, I think that using one exam to admit the incoming class verges on being logistically impossible. As an educator and citizen using this exam this year, when some students have lost significant education for the entire last year, seems unconscionable. To those who ask us to keep things the same, the truth is that it is already impossible to keep things the same. The pandemic has ensured that Hunter's entering class will be demographically different, no matter what at this point. In general, using one admissions exam is not congruent with Hunter College High School's mission statement, which asks us to pursue both excellence and representation. This test is designed to force errors so that we can select for the very small number of students that we can admit. Not all tests work like this, for example, the purpose of a driving test is to find out whether one will be safe on the road. There is a cutoff for qualification. In fact, most academic tests are designed to check for mastery and qualification. I see the fact that there are more students who can excel at Hunter than the number we can admit as an opportunity. I'd like to make an analogy. The Hunter test is like the Olympics, where it is indisputable that all medalists are great athletes. However, we have also all known great athletes who have missed medals due to one poorly timed injury or a bad day. More importantly for the equity comparison, it is arguable whether the Olympics represents the best way to discover and foster global athletic talent. In fact, one could argue that there are some events where only athletes from countries that have made significant investments have a chance. Alternately, one could approach the Hunter admissions system from qualification instead of a forced error model, and then use additional criteria to choose a class from all those who are capable of meeting Hunter's academic demands. Speaking as an alum, a teacher, and a test writer, I'm confident that we do not have to lower standards to admit a diverse class. There are CUNY and Hunter administrators who are working on this problem, and I believe in their passion and capability to serve our institution. Hunter teachers have and are also approaching- Time expired. Sorry, uh, with our, may I finish? Yes, you may, please continue. Thank you. Um, Hunter teachers uh, have also started our own research and initiatives, including submitting an extensive middle states report 10 years ago to call on admissions reform for equity. We understand the Hunter's admission is a complex and longstanding problem, and it is embedded within other systemic inequalities. It is both a symptom of and contributes to widespread discrimination, and therefore it is an issue of public interest. I believe it will take multiple constituents working from many angles to make positive and sustainable change, just as other selective schools elsewhere in the country have done. And that's why I'm here to speak in support of my students' work. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Victoria. I'd like to now call on Eliza Kurbuska to testify. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you for creating the platform for students' voices. My name is Eliza Kuberska, and I have been teaching mathematics for 19 years in New York City, 18 at Hunter College High School. I'm here representing myself in support of students' calls to improve the admission process to Hunter College High School. Uh, 
The pandemic has deepened the performance and the knowledge gap between those who have quiet spaces to study with seamless Wi-Fi connection and those who do not. We have a duty to address this gap by enriching and diversifying our admissions process. I have been privileged to teach students whose work ethic, ability to solve mathematical conundrums, and creativity have inspired me to be a better teacher and a human. As an educator, I clearly have benefited from the results of the entrance exam, as the students are excellent. Over the years, through conversations with my students, I gained anecdotal evidence that a few of them started prepping for the entrance exam in a third grade. In contrast, free prep programs for students in a lower income bracket begin in sixth grade. That translates into a gap of at least 100 hours. Would 100 hours extra of practicing piano for a talented musician make a difference? The pandemic only has increased the disparity. I came from Poland to the US in 92. My mathematical knowledge acquired in a high school located in a small Polish town put me a year ahead of my New York City classmates in an honors math class of the ID program. Hence, I am aware of the power of learned material and its optical illusion in the context of giftedness. Though I was more knowledgeable, I was not more talented. For at least two decades, New York City fostered a culture of tutoring that clearly has benefited the wealthy and it is visible in the demographics of the entering class. How can we address it as a public institution? While Hunter has a single test admissions policy, another giant in a public education, namely Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology in Virginia, stepped aside this year from the singular approach and now describes their admissions process, and I quote, students will be evaluated on their GPA, a student portrait sheet where they will be asked to demonstrate portrait of a graduate attributes and 20, 21st century skills, a problem solving essay and experience factors, including students who are economically disadvantaged, English language learners, special education students, or students who are currently attending underrepresented middle schools. In addition to GPA and state exam results, Boston Public Schools chose to use a combination of zip codes that indicated median income in their selection process, since their admissions working committee, quote, found that using geographic means... Time expired. May? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Quote, found that using geographic measures like zip codes or census tract in the admissions process resulted in socioeconomic, racial, and geographic diversity that is more representative of the city overall. When Hunter College High School was founded in 1869, and it was known as Female Normal and High School, women did not have voting rights in most countries in the world. In 1955, when it officially took its form as a lab school for gifted girls, many countries still did not allow women to cast votes. The school enabled social mobility for those with no public voice, but with much talent. Should we not do it again? This time, players have changed. St statistical on COVID indicates that the pandemic has impacted people of color the most. To outweigh the monetary influence of private tutoring that prepares students well for the exam, we need to diversify the process. In my opinion, an entrance exam may be necessary, but is insufficient to be a sole factor in the admissions to Hunter College High School. Considering public health and logistics, it may not be even possible to offer it this year. Currently, we are living in a divided world. We should not further deepen the gap by not adapting to the changed reality. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza. I will now call on Aruna Das to testify. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Aruna Das and I'm a junior at Hunter involved with Hunter College High School for Diversity, the student group pushing for admissions reform. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak today. I'll talk a little on the four main reasons why the Hunter test can't take place in any form this year. So one, as you all know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Many New Yorkers still haven't received their vaccines and we don't want the Hunter test to turn into another super spreader event. 
roughly 3,000 students come in from across the city to take the Hunter test, which is three hours long and has always been administered indoors at Hunter College's 68th Street campus and our school building on 94th Street. We call our school building the brick prison because it has practically no windows. It's a disastrous place to administer a three hour test. This year would also require more proctors than ever and put those proctors at risk. Not all of our faculty have been vaccinated yet. My second point is that it would further disadvantage low income students. We've already heard that the test places obstacles for kids from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, but we have reason to believe that this year will have more obstacles than ever. I'm sure that all of you know that uh, of all students, low income students have been the worst hit by the pandemic. Lack of access to safe learning environment, to stable internet, to technology, to steady meals, to learning resources that they would have had in school have all taken their toll. These students are falling behind through no fault of their own. If the Hunter test, which tests above grade level material is used as an admissions factor in 2021, it will admit a class of students uh, socioeconomically skewed like never before. It's not just because of disparate access to education. There's also a $70 fee to take the Hunter test. That's more money than it takes to take the SAT. While, the, while Hunter does offer a reduced fee of $25, the paperwork is nightmarish. The reduced fee waiver requires income documentation as well as a separate reduced fee application. The labor intensive process of applying for aid may discourage many families. Indeed, Queller Prep, a popular Hunter Prep outfits, a website recommends against it because it's just not worth it. The test fee could be more of a barrier than ever because many families are unemployed or struggling financially in New York City due to the pandemic. Administering the test online would also disadvantage kids with limited access to technology and the internet. Stable internet connection is never guaranteed and high quality internet costs money. My third point, as a, as a student, I can also tell you that administering a secure virtual hunter test is really difficult and it would have to rely on the honor system. Time expired. May I continue? Yes, you may. Thank you. And my last point is that in any case, the traditional way of qualifying for the Hunter test has been rendered moot by the pandemic. Public school students qualify through their fifth grade state test scores, a system that already, as you've heard, has its flaws. But this year, students won't have taken the state test in fifth grade. Using their fourth grade state test as a metric would only serve to exacerbate the exclusion of students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Private school students have to take the separate test to qualify for the Hunter test itself, which is obviously not a realistic system this year. I could go on and on, but as you can see, there are so many reasons why the test shouldn't take place this year. We receive so much support from faculty, students, alumni, and parents. They all recognize that it's imperative that we act now. As my fellow teachers, not my fellow teachers, my teachers and fellow students have already said, the infeasibility of the Hunter test during the pandemic year gives us an opportunity to try out alternative admissions processes that are safe and equitable. I hope that CUNY will recognize this opportunity and work with us to make Hunter a school that represents New York. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Aruna. Um, before I turn to Chair Barron for questions, I'd like to remind uh, council members to use the raise hand function on Zoom to indicate that they have a question for this panel. And I'll turn it over to you now, Chair Barron. Uh, thank you so much to this panel. We felt that it was critical that we hear from you so that you can give us your perspective as students and as faculty members as to what is happening on the ground so that when the administration delivers their testimony, we'll have a primary source material to ask them about what their intentions are moving forward. Um, I particularly was interested in the, 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 the fact that the test is designed to have forced errors. And if you could speak just a little about that, uh, Ms. Meng, if you could talk about that just a little bit. Can you unmute Ms. Meng? Thank you. Yes. 
Um, uh, so there are different ways to think about the purpose of testing. And uh, um, because we have so few seats, our test is designed to have a very widespread of possible performances. Um, and what that means is that then one could go down the score list and say, okay, here is where we can admit, for, for example, 175 students. Mm -hmm. um, but that is only one way to think about how tests work. To take an absurd example, if I were to um, give a grammar test to 100 students and all of them fail, um, mm -hmm. I can't take the top 10 scorers and say you get A's. That would, that would be not, not pedagogically sound. Um, on the other side, it doesn't make sense to say uh, all of my students did receive 90 points or higher on my grammar exam, but only the top you know, three will get A's. Um, so, so the Hunter test, the way that it's designed is partially due to how few students we can admit. But I, I do think that at this moment of, of, of reconsideration, um, it's possible to actually say who are qualified. How do we design a test that shows that these are students who can, who can actually do well at Hunter? And then, uh, and, and it doesn't have to be a test. It could be the state test. It could be grades. There could be multiple paths for entry, right? So any various uh, ways to say, what's our total pool of students who qualify? And then we've solved one, we've met one part of our mission statement, which is excellence. And then to meet the other side of our mission statement from this pool, how can we admit a okay. diverse student body? Right, okay, great, thank you. Uh, and the first two students, I think Leonardo and Chloe, your particularly uh, testimony focused on the isolation, I believe was a term that was used, the pressure, uh, the lack of ability to easily afford uh, equipment if you were going to be participating in some of the sports that had those kinds of things and the lack of resources perhaps due to poor connectivity that impact what's going on in the learning environment, not just in the school, but at home as well. So if either one of you could just briefly uh, talk about whether or not you feel Hunter is aware of that and what resources they are providing in that regard. Have you made that known to them? And if uh, have they responded in any kind of way to that? Just briefly, because I do wanna allow my colleague uh, Council Member Lander to ask questions as well. Um, I think the responsibility is falling a lot more on the teachers themselves than the administration. Um, because speaking personally from like my own experience, um, at least during the pandemic that's going on right now, um, I've, I've met with more teachers one-on-one -on -one, um, and I've met with a lot more teachers one on one just so I can um, at least get some study time or somewhere to like where I can get the resources available um, to study. And before all of that, um, before the coronavirus, the most help I could get was um, usually taken up by other students because it's all it's all together. Um, I th I think that in general, it's student help that students get from the school has to fall on like more the individual teachers, which is stressful for those teachers. Um, from what I can see, because like twenty students coming to one teacher um, every day is a, very over overwhelming, um, and I think that the school can do a lot better. And they, there are some efforts to do that with like writing centers and um, math centers and stuff like that, but they don't see as much traction and they also suffer from the problem uh, where students need individualized attention towards their own problems in school. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to the moderator because I would like for her to acknowledge my colleague and uh, ha have him uh, poses questions. I know he's got to bounce around a couple of places. 
Thank you, Chair Barron. And I will now call on Council Member Landers. Um, I believe Council Member Mizell was here, but he does not appear to be here anymore. So Council Member Landers. I think he's muted. Okay. Thank you. They let me unmute. Uh, Chair Barron, thank you so much for convening this really important hearing. And of course, we're providing space for student voice uh, first and uh, students, especially uh, alumni and faculty as well, but students, especially, thank you. I just want to appreciate your organizing, your courage. I know this is not easy to do. And I was actually looking back at my notes and I see that 10 years ago this spring, the Hunter College High School commencement speaker was a young man named Justin Hudson, a black student at Hunter, who spoke really courageously at commencement in a hard way, calling out these issues long before, you know, Nicole Hannah-Jones and, you know, the work that some of us have done in a long tradition of having the courage to call out systemic racism when you see it uh, and to show up and fight. And, you know, progress was not made at that time and progress was not made a couple of years ago in a renewed effort. Um, but I believe you are making progress. We have to push harder and Chair Barron is leading the way and we have your backs. Um, change can be made for next fall's admissions progress process and beyond. Um, but it's your organizing that is really leading the way here, just without any doubt. And I just want to praise the detailed research you've put into it, the thoughtfulness of approach, the openness to dialogue and engagement, but the fierce and insistent organizing. It is in the tradition of winning civil rights, and it's hard and courageous. Um, when, when Justin gave that speech, he said, um, if you truly believe that the demographics of Hunter represent the distribution of intelligence in this city, then you must believe that the Upper West Side, Bayside, and Flushing are intrinsically more intelligent than the South Bronx, Bedford-Stuyvesant, and Washington Heights, and I refuse to accept that. And you guys refuse to accept that. You know that from who you are and the students you talk to, that what our city can be is one that recognizes the intelligence from across all those neighborhoods and builds a genuinely inclusive multiracial Hunter College High School and a genuinely inclusive multiracial New York City democracy. And we're in your debt today. And, um, and I'm really glad that you are pushing. So um, we've got a long hearing. We want to get to hearing from and pushing on the administration. So um, I won't ask you more questions, but I really just want to honor uh, your organizing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Lander. Um, seeing no other council members waiting to ask questions, I will now turn back to Chair for additional questions. Uh, Chair Barron. Thank you so much. I, I do have a few other questions. Do you feel that the administration is honestly grasping and looking to make a change? Just gonna get straight to it. Because I did hear you say that there was a task force, but there's been a lack of response to the issues that were raised in the task force. So any one of you, uh, I'll, I'll go to the students. <laughs> I think Chloe has her hand raised. Can you unmute, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to first say that I think like a really big issue like that I, I think has been brought up so many times by especially like leaders in our black and Latinx and our low income communities. They have spoken to how demoralizing it is to be a student in an unrepresented community at Hunter because it, we, it throughout the school climate and everything, like it is just so fervent that people, people make remarks that just like put you down and say that you don't deserve to be here, even if it is, isn't explicit. And I think we, as administrators, we have, we've gone to them for a long time and we have gone to them for, it's been since June, that's like eight months, nine months. And we've been asking for them to just publicly say that we need to make changes and publicly commit to making changes and reforming our admission system. And they've done none of that. They haven't made a public statement saying that diversity is important at our school and diversity is one of our main goals. And by not making it public and by not saying that this is important to us and this is one of our main concerns, it set, sends a message to the rest of the school community that diversity isn't an important piece of the Hunter community and of Hunter's, Hunter's educational goals and everything like that. And 
yeah, I just wanted to say that I think it, I think it's really telling and I, I, I really do hope that things change. And, and Durga, as the, uh, I think you said you were the president of the student body, what kinds of ongoing uh, programs or town halls or interactions are a part of what happens at Hunter College High School to raise a kind of awareness that needs to take place or the kind of dialogue? Can you unmute, can you unmute Durga? Wait, wait, Durga, can you unmute Durga? One second, okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so through HCHS for Diversity is where we've been hosting a lot of the community engagement um, and teach-ins and using our platforms to create uh, room for discussions. And I know many of our teachers um, we're working with them to, to host like dialogue, et cetera, um, in their classroom. And I know like Ms. Meng and other teachers have been really um, forward about making sure that these dialogues happen and that we are, and um, also discussing internally with the administration about what can be done, such as through their seminar workshops and, and other initiatives that um, our own, like our, our new amazing APs um, and others are, are leading efforts in, at our school. Um, and one other thing I wanted to say about your previous question um, is that we are, again, as you know, really asking for a proactive stance for the administration to set the standards and to, to, to make it clear that our commission in the task force is to create this pro-diversity admissions, that that is what we're looking for and that that is the goal um, of what we will be doing this work for. Um, like we, uh, I know uh, Councilmember Brad Lander just brought up, like the, the 2010 efforts, many have put so many hours into creating models and there are so many that exist as well. Um, so the administration taking a proactive stand saying that we this is what we are seeking um, is really, really key right now. Okay, great. I think that concludes my questions. I just want to echo the comments of my colleague. I applaud you for being active, not sitting on the sideline and just complaining amongst yourselves, but reaching out and making sure that things are changed and raising your voice and educating others and for being committed because it's a battle that is going to take a lot of ongoing work. It doesn't happen overnight. Revolutions never do. And yes, you're fighting not just against but it's happening at Hunter College High School. But that's just a reflection of what's happening across this city and across this country. And people don't want to have change. They don't want to uh, make the adjustments even when it's within their power to do that. But we wanna encourage you. Uh, we're gonna to continue to work with you. And we believe that we will be able to get that change that we need. We know that much of the change that came last June, as was reflected in the budget, was because of the pressure that was applied and the dialogue that had to take place to get the results that we wanted. So we're gonna to continue to work with you. We appreciate all of our, my colleagues as well who have signed on to the letters and we're gonna to continue to move forward. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, Chair Barron. We will now turn to CUNY. Now from the administration, we have Andrea Sunichin, who's the University Dean for K-16 initiatives. And for questions, we will have Sabra Pacheco, the Admissions Director at Hunter College Campus School. I will now administer the oath to the administration. When you hear your name, please respond once, once a member of our staff unmutes you. And okay, so University Dean Sunichin, Yes. Yeah. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honest, honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Director Pacheco, do yeah. you affirm? Thank you. Do you yeah. affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. I will now call on University Dean Sunichin. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Andrea Sunichin, University Dean for K through 16 initiatives at CUNY. I wanna start by thanking you for this opportunity to speak with you today about CUNY's early college high schools. 
these schools are reflective of the spirit of innovation and commitment to education that CUNY embodies. I joined CUNY uh, Central Administration a year ago after almost 20 years supporting college access and success for New York City's young people through community-based organizations, research settings, and the New York City Department of Education. Along the way, I was able to earn a doctorate in education. Like millions of New Yorkers, I have CUNY to thank for much of this. My father immigrated to New York from the West Indies and worked his way through an engineering degree at City College. His degrees opened doors for him, empowered him to fight the bias that he often experienced as he rose through his career, and gave my family entry to economic security and a life well beyond what he ever imagined for himself. New York City has been a place of community and opportunity for my family, and I've dedicated my career to ensuring our city remain a place where all students can envision and achieve their brightest possible future. Early college high schools are public schools that partner with institutions of higher education to blend rigorous college prep curriculum with the opportunity to earn up to two years of college credit while in high school at no cost to students and their families. The program is designed to scaffold the transition from high school to college with additional supports and make sure students are ready to jump into courses rather than needing remedial education when they arrive. Research has shown that dual enrollment improves college transitions, persistence and completion, especially for students traditionally underrepresented in higher education. The City University of New York's Early College Initiative, CUNY ECI, was established in 2003 to develop and support early college high schools in New York City. Today, CUNY ECI is responsible for 20 early college high schools that serve over 10,000 students. They are partnered with six community colleges, Borough of Manhattan, Bronx, Hostos, Kingsborough, Queensborough, and LaGuardia, and seven senior colleges, Brooklyn College, City Tech, City College, Hunter College, Queens College, York College, and the College of Staten Island. Hunter College High School, which has been the focus of our conversation so far this morning, is not one of these 20 schools. ECI provides guidance, project management, and financial resources to create and maintain early college schools. We have four different models across the city. There are six, six through 12 schools that offer integrated academic experiences and supports beginning in middle school and allow students to begin taking college courses as early as ninth grade. Students may earn up to 60 college credits and an or an associate's degree in liberal arts. There are two nine through 12 schools that provide accelerated academic programs, including four years of rigorous math and science credit. These students have a substantial head start when applying to college, spending their last years of high schools on the partner college campus. There are two nine through 13 schools, which offer an optional fifth year for increased college exploration and the opportunity to earn an associate's degree in the liberal arts. And there are 10 9 to 14 schools known as PTEX, which stands for Pathways in Technology for Early College High School. These students are provided a pathway to complete their high school diploma, an associate's degree, and workplace preparation for in-demand jobs in technology, manufacturing, healthcare, and finance. The ECI model was designed to serve low-income youth, first-generation college goers, English language learners, and other groups that have been historically underrepresented in higher education. In 2019, our diverse student population of approximately 9,200 students included over 40% that identified as Latinx or Hispanic, nearly 35% who identified as Black, 13% as Asian, the remaining 10% identified as white, native, or unknown. The population was 48% female and 52% male. As evidenced by census tract, 31% of all ECI students come from neighborhoods with the lowest average income and 25% come from neighborhoods with below average socioeconomic status. 6.4% of students were English language learners and 16.3% of students had an individualized education plan. Our students' academic preparation upon entering high school is wide ranging as evidenced by their eighth grade exams. In 2019, nearly 50% scored a one or a two on their ELA exams, while nearly two thirds, 65%, scored a one or a two on math exams. While fully representing the ethnic, racial, demographic, and academic diversity of our city students, ECI students, 
graduate from high school on time at a higher rate than similar students. In 2019, the high school graduation rate across our schools was 88.9%, exceeding the New York City DOE average of 77.3%. Impressively, they managed this with a course load that also includes college level classes, earning an average of 29.3 college credits upon graduation, catalyzing their post-secondary momentum. We have found that these credits on average put them a semester closer to graduation by the end of their second year. Further, they are well equipped for college coursework with 87.7% and 77.9% demonstrating English language um, and math proficiency respectively. Among graduates of the class of 2019, nearly 65% stayed with CUNY in one of two ways. Over 20% enrolled in their grades 13 program and the rest, 42.4% matriculate into CUNY on their own. We have also found that ECI alumni are more likely to remain enrolled after two years. Another 24% of graduates go on to SUNY or other public and private colleges. Of note, two schools offer the opportunity to earn an associate's degree by the end of 12th grade. 45.2% of graduating students at Hostos Lincoln Academy of Science and nearly 80% of students at Kingsborough Early College Secondary School graduate having earned their degree. The New York City Department of Education Office of Enrollment determines admissions methods for our schools. Our schools have two types of admissions methods. 10 of our schools, Hero High School, City Polytechnic, PTEC, Manhattan Early College for Advertising, BTEC, Energy Tech, Inwood Early College for Health and Information Tech, Port Richmond High School, Academy for Careers in Television and Film, and Bronx Academy for Software Engineering are educational option for open admission. That means every applicant is assigned a, a number as in a random lottery. Programs with open and educational option admissions methods use students randomly assigned numbers and may also use admissions priorities to make offers. When there are more applicants than seats, students are admitted in order by their randomly assigned numbers. If the program also uses admissions priorities, all applicants from the first priority group are admitted for any students from the second priority group, regardless of their randomly assigned numbers. The other half, 10 of our schools, Hostos Lincoln Academy of Science, Brooklyn College Academy, Kingsborough Early College Secondary School, Manhattan Hunter Science High School, York Early College, Middle College High School at LaGuardia, Queen School of Inquiry, International High School at LaGuardia, and City College Academy of the Arts are screened for their high school admissions. Six of these 10 schools are six through 12 schools that have no screening for their middle school admissions and very limited seats for ninth grade entry. Our screen programs evaluate applicants for admission based on the program's selection criteria and assign a ranking number to applicants based on that evaluation evaluation, starting with the top ranked applicant as number one. Ranked applicants receive orders, it offers in ranking order. If a program also has admissions priorities, offers are made to ranked applicants in a priority group order. Our program selection criteria includes academic records, interviews, essays, and more to evaluate and rank students. The selection criteria that a program uses is called and the way that the programs explain these criteria is called a rubric. Student information is then applied to the rubric to determine a ranking order. Prospective students learn about our schools through a variety of ways. The DOE publishes a high school directory each year with a range of information, including admissions, program offer offerings, clubs, and sports. Each community school district publishes a similar directory to provide information on district middle schools. To increase diversity, School admissions are based on ranked choice and lottery systems. Last year, one of our schools, Manhattan Hunter Science High School, launched a diversity initiative through the DOE's Office of Enrollment to give priority to applicants eligible for free and reduced lunch based on family income for 69% of seats. Each year, our schools are encouraged to participate in district, borough, and citywide fairs where they share informational materials with families and dates and times for open house tours. Schools also do direct outreach to elementary and middle schools in their districts and promote their schools on social media and their websites. 
ECI schools expect that all students will have the opportunity to earn college credits while in high school. We have forged and maintained strong relationships with partner colleges, faculty, and administrators who collectively aim to ensure access and success for all of our students. Their shared attention to curriculum development, community outreach, as well as staff recruitment and professional development have led to greater numbers of students completing high school and entering college ready with nearly a year's worth of credit earned to their, to their name and at no cost to them. We are proud of the accomplishments of the staff and students who have achieved so much through the Early College Initiative and look forward to continuing this work alongside our partners. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Dean Sunichin. Um, before I turn to Chair Barron, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function on Zoom to indicate that they have a question for this panel. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, and I have lots of questions for the panel. First of all, I wanna thank you for coming and sharing your testimony with us. And since the student panel that preceded you was specifically talking about Hunter, uh, I want to begin with those questions. I also see we've been joined by council member uh, Rodriguez. I want to acknowledge him. He is a member of the committee as well. So in terms of Hunter College High School, what is the relationship between CUNY and Hunter College High School. Uh, I think you're muted. I don't hear anything. Oh, I think I, my my colleague uh, from Hunter College High School, Sabra, is here. If she can uh, address questions about Hunter. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so Hunter College High School, I guess in the simplest term, falls under the governance of um, CUNY and of uh, the college. That's the nature of the relationship between the school and, uh, and CUNY. Okay, who has jurisdiction over the admission policy for Hunter College High School? Hey, well, the admissions policy itself uh, would, would again, fall under and, and anything that, uh, you know, again, us falling under the governance of CUNY and under the college means that ultimately, ultimately, uh, any major changes or major overhauls to the system would um, be done with guidance, under guidance and direction from, from those two entities. How would that happen? What would be the steps to change the admission policy to get into Hunter College? Because this is just very too broad for me. I'm just, you know, it's not targeted and specific enough for me to get a clear understanding. What would be the steps to change the admission policy for Hunter College High School? Well, I think one of, one of the most important steps is what we're in the process of doing now, right? So in response to much of what the students have testified to today, including our faculty, in response to their suggestions and, and proposals and um, expression of their passion about this topic. In response to that, the president of Hunter College uh, convened a presidential task force and that task force specifically is the task force to advance racial equity. It's a college-wide task force, but specifically since the campus schools falls under the college, we have our own sort of um, subset of that task force, which is in and of itself its own task force. And the president of the college has specifically um, 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 asked us to look into three specific areas with respect to the campus schools. Uh, so the task force will examine um, admissions, curriculum, and climate and suggest uh, create goals and a work plan to accomplish, you know, with strategies to accomplish those goals. So that is the first and probably biggest step to us enacting any sort of change. It's going to start with this task force, which as the students mentioned, has just started to work. And 
uh, what is the time frame that this task force is expected to complete its work? Uh, it, in my opinion, I hope the task force is something that that um, continues its work for quite some time. Uh, this is a, a really large issue. I don't think this is one that can be resolved in a matter of you know months. Um, the task force is beginning its work now. Uh, the expectation is that we have some semblance of um, strategy, goals and strategies by the end of this semester in June, but with the hopes that we, it will continue its work through the next academic year. What, okay, that's, that's troubling. Normally when this council establishes a task force, they have a start date and an end date so that the recommendations that come out of that task force can begin to be examined and implemented. So now if we're talking about a task force which doesn't have a, an end date and wants to just be ongoing. I mean, there might be another kind of entity that would take place afterwards, but to say, well, it's gonna take time, we need to move on, is not in any way um, comforting or addressing the issue of when can we think we would have a change in the policy. So it's very, you know, amorphous and it's going to keep going and we have these great objectives, but uh, uh, it's troubling that you don't have an end date to make recommendations and then have those recommendations um, reacted to and a plan come from that. Um, Madam Chair, I, I should probably be more clear. I thought I mentioned that uh, the initial suggestions and proposals from the task force are expected in June. That's the end of our semester, so June. Um, with the hopes, though, that the work of the task force will continue through into the next academic year. So in June, we can expect to have a list of recommendations from the task force that will address the three major areas you talked about, admissions, curriculum, and climate? Your question is, should we, do we hope to have uh, suggestions and recommendations from the task force? I would hope that we do. Many of the people who offered testimony here today are members of that same task force. So it is my hope that all of us together, uh, the fact, both the faculty members and students who are here uh, offering testimony today, it's my hope that we will have something uh, in writing submitted to the president of the college in June. So again, that, that's my point. It, you know, it's a hope, but it's not a, a definite time that we can say by June. It's much more um, indefinite. Well, no, my yeah. My plan is June. Uh, we also have to get the input of those who are who are here today, who are a part of that work. So um, I'm confident that we will have something to submit in June. And when those recommendations come forth, what's the next step? I'm trying to get to how we're going to change the admission policy at Hunter College High School, which only has two percent black students and and six percent Latino. So I, I'm I'm not comfortable or please to know, well, you know, we're going to do this. And do. Once those recommendations come, which we hope will come in June, what would be the next step? If those recommendations from the task force come and say, listen, there should be, there should not be one single standardized test, which we create at Hunter College High School uh, that we use to select students for admission. So if in fact that is one of the recommendations that comes forth, then what happens to that recommendation? What's the weight of the recommendation? Because unfortunately, the city has a history, the city, not Hunter College High School, but the city has a history of having tasks. We, uh, I, I'm probably the oldest one here. So I remember the Kerner Commission report and it was a great report and it sat. So unless these task force, which have great, participants on them and come up with very thorough uh, recommendations based on a lot of work and research, unless they are empowered to know that something's going to happen, not just a report, we'll be back again talking about how Hunter College High School has continued a decline and having uh, students that represent the city as a part of them. So once those recommendations come forth, what would be the weight that they would have and what can we expect will be implemented based on those recommendations? It's hard to answer a question with respect to what will occur after the recommendations are received when the recommendations haven't been received yet. Uh, the task force, in fact, the 
subcommittee, the admission subcommittee of the task force uh, convenes in a matter of hours today. Uh, and that's its first order of business. Uh, I can perhaps get back to you with that, uh, with a more substantial answer <laughs> after the task force itself has a chance to, it's particularly that subcommittee has a chance to meet today to flesh out its goals and uh, its strategic plan for getting there. Okay. Um, if in fact, Hunter College comes, Hunter College High School comes with the recommendations for additional kinds of criteria to be used. Who has the authority to put that into place? I know you said it's under the guidance of the uh, CUNY and the college, but who has the ultimate authority to decide what happens? Who makes a decision? Who has to approve it? Does it have to go to the board of trustees? Is it simply uh, something that happens at the college level? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, since I'm not, I don't want to misspeak. Uh, there are a lot of different parties involved, as you mentioned, trustees and, and CUNY, overall CUNY itself and the college. I don't want to give you the wrong information. I can get back to you on who specifically has the ultimate authority. I do believe it's a combination of those groups. Okay, I, I would like to have that uh, response. Uh, my my council will uh, usually, what we do at the end is formalize questions and, and because that's that's the heart. You know, we're doing all this work, but to what end, to what process, who has the authority, who can say, is it the president herself? This is what it's going to be. Is it the president in conjunction with the CUNY chancellor? Is it the president plus the chancellor that sent it to the board of trustees? It's just too vague. It's just very vague. And, and we would like to get something definitive, whatever documents uh, have that information, we would love to see what those are. Um, I have many, many more questions, but I want to allow my colleagues to ask their questions as well. So I'll turn it back to the moderator and then um, I'll come back with more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Barron. I will now call on council members with questions in the order they have used the raised hand function in Zoom. So that currently will be Majority Leader, leader Combo, followed by Council Member Landers. Council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the raised hand function in Zoom, please do so now. Also remember to keep your questions and answers to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will maintain a clock and a member of staff will unmute you. You may begin after I call you and the Sergeant gives you the cue. So we will now hear from, cal from Council Member uh, Combo. Time starts now. You're muted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Barron. Um, my question is in regards to something that was spoken on during the testimony. Um, Andrea, I apologize on my Zoom. I can't see your full last name. It abbreviates it. So uh, you were talking a bit about the, um, I guess the pipelines to CUNY in terms of some of the um, educational programs that lead into it. So in my district, we have a school called Medgar Evers uh, Preparatory High School. And it's one of the leading high schools in the city. And it's certainly a pathway for Medgar Evers College and others. Now I understand the issue that they're facing now is that although Medgar Evers Preparatory High School is considered an early high school, it's being treated in the instance that I'm talking about as a middle school. And so the DOE has removed the screens um, or the testing application process um, in order to get into Medgar Evers Preparatory um, High School, early high school. And the school is very concerned that students will not be prepared, like that the, that the pipeline to Medgar Evers High School, to Medgar Evers Preparatory High School, um, and then to the college is going to be disrupted once those screens are removed because of the rigorous curriculum of that particular school. Has there been any conversation or discussion around removing the screens? I believe there are six early high schools that do have the screen, that previously had the screen process, 
but now will no longer have that screen process. And they are concerned if the removal of those screens will impact um, the level of academic coursework that's needed to go to high school and then to the college. Are you aware of that? And has there been discussion about that? Uh, so Medgar Evers um, prep is not one of the CUNY early college high schools. Um, that's in, in my portfolio. Um, it's probably similar to Hunter in that it's um, sort of independently uh, uh, managed by the uh, administration at Medgar um, and it's a, a DOE high school. So DOE's Office of Enrollment um, would be the appropriate group to talk to about any concerns with Medgar, changes to Medgar's um, admissions criteria. We do run several six through 12 schools in our portfolio of 20 early, um, early college high schools. And um, in part, it, you know, because of the pandemic, middle school screening um, has been lifted or is very different for the coming year. None of our schools um, in our portfolio have expressed concern about that. Um, we understand that this is a really challenging time and all of our schools are getting ready to embrace and support the students they receive next year, understanding that they will come in with um, a lot of different needs um, and, and that we will be prepared um, and we, we know that we can support all students in being successful. So the screen for the schools in your portfolio, did they have screens previously and are those screens being lifted at this time? I would have to get back to you um, with specifics across the 20 schools. Um, there, there's some variations, about, so I could follow up with you for, for each one of them, what, what specifically is different for the coming year. And for the ones that you do know about, is this lifting of the screen a temporary um, decision in regards to the pandemic or is this now a permanent decision moving forward? And permanent, of course, permanency changes, but is it considered that this will be the new practice moving forward? Uh, so uh, DOE's Office of Enrollment uh, manages admissions policies. Um, they have framed changes for this year as a pause. Um, I don't believe that they've announced er, any sort of permanent um, ongoing change to admissions um, after, for, after this year. They have not yet done that. Okay, thank you. Those are all the questions I had. Thank you, Majority Leader Cumbo. We'll now turn to Council Member Landers for his questions. Time starts now. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Chair Barron, again for this hearing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, after the students spoke 10 years ago this spring with alumna Elena Kagan, nominated by President Obama to serve on the Supreme Court, and long before the current wave of activism for school integration and for Black Lives, Hunter College High School commencement speaker Justin Hudson gave a powerful address. I read his quote before, uh, if you truly believe that the demographics of Hunter represent the distribution of intelligence in this city, then you must believe that the Upper West Side, Bayside and Flushing are intrinsically more intelligent than the South Bronx, Bed-Stuy and Washington Heights. And I refuse to accept that. Unfortunately, at that time, President Rabb and, then Hunter's D and the then Hunter Dean for Diversity said no to any changes. Parents, faculty members, and alumni feel very strongly the test is very valuable in terms of preserving the kind of specialness and uniqueness the school had. Two years ago, there was another movement for school integration. At that time as well, Lisa Sigmund, then the admissions uh, director, uh, said, at this time, I would say no. We know that our test is producing highly successful students in our highly successful school. So on the one hand, I'm glad that the activism of the current students is changing things and that there's at least openness to change. But that task force and its timeline is two years too late, is 10 years too late. Um, and it also doesn't sound like it is producing any proposals for this year's admissions process for next fall's incoming class at Hunter. So I guess my first question is, um, are you aware that selective high schools in so many other cities, Boston Latin, San Francisco's Lowell High School, Thomas Jefferson High School, and Maggie Walker Governor's High School in Virginia, have all suspended their admissions test and adopted alternative pro-diversity admission systems for this pandemic year. Is that question for me? Yes, yes, are you aware of that? Yes, I am aware of that. Okay, is that under consideration for this incoming falls class at Hunter College High School? There are a lot of things under consideration for this falls incoming class to Hunter College High School. 
what are they? Because you talked a lot about this task force and long-term change. I guess I would like to know what is under consideration for the pandemic year admission and when you'll, when you'll have something more concrete to tell us. We will have something more concrete to share with everyone, not only the people who are here, but with the, the public over in general in the city uh, very shortly. But that's not something that I can share here right now. So after 10 years of waiting and two years of waiting and setting up a task force that might have results in June, you also don't have a date for when you will know what your admissions process is for the fall. We do not yet, we're not in a position yet to uh, confirm what those plans are for this fall's incoming class. You have one, but you're not yet in position to confirm it, it sounds like is what you're telling me. No, that's not what I said. What I said is we are not in a position to confirm. So we are still working on whatever sure. needs to be worked on and we are not in a position to share that information right now. You, you it sounds like you're be being very shortly. clear in what you're, so do you know it? Because it sounds like you're telling me you can't confirm it or you can't share it. Um, has a preliminary internal decision been made on what next year's admissions process will be? Uh, we, there we are in, we are still in uh, the determination phase of what will occur for next year. As you can imagine, this is a very, very large process. Um, so it's, it's not something that's being taken lightly. And we will soon be able to share with everyone what the process will be for this coming year. Um, so I'll say, you know, I, I, you know we're going to have our preliminary budget hearing more broadly in this committee on higher education, you know, and the city provides a lot of the funding for Hunter College High School. Uh, within one month, do you think by then you will know uh, whether you are suspending the admissions for next year? I'm sure within one month, yes, I am sure that we will be in a position to know what we're doing and we'll be able to share that with the public. Okay, I mean, to be honest, and I, look, I, I, you know, I, I appreciate that there's a lot going on. You, you pretty clearly communicated that an internal decision has already been made on what's going to happen next year that you're not you know, going to share with us now because they're still finalizing it. Um, that, you know, I, I hope, look, I think what would be a great down, I guess, let me ask it like this. Um, if you, if you, let me, I guess I'll ask the question this way. As you are proceeding with this longer term task force, doing really important work because what school culture is, what the curriculum is matters enormously into whether uh, achieving more integration will work. Um, what do you think the impact would be uh, of moving toward a more integrated and diverse school community of choosing for this year to follow the lead of Boston Latin and those other schools in suspending uh, the one single high stakes admissions test this year uh, versus continuing forward with it? I'm expired. So I, I, I can't speak to what we can do in, in comparison to those other schools. None of the schools that you mentioned are in the city of New York. Uh, they're very different schools in very different places. What I can say is we are looking into and, and starting to finalize what will occur with this year's process. And assisting us in this effort is uh, an educational equity expert who came to us actually at the recommendation of some of the people who offered testimony earlier today. That person has been enlisted uh, to offer assistance and support to help guide us in some of those decisions uh, for this year's process. And that person was an instrumental um, piece to change in some of those other, uh, with, in some of those other schools that you just named. Okay, so that's the first thing you said that at least gives me a little reason for hope and optimism. So I'm gonna take it. I am glad that you have hired someone to think about this year's admissions process and beyond who did work with those other schools. I guess the, I will disagree that the fact that this is New York should be used as a way of saying we can't be more ambitious and move more quickly to achieve a Hunter College incoming student body as diverse as New York City. Honestly, you've got the extraordinary diversity and resources of these brilliant young people in all those communities in Bed-Stuy and Washington Heights and the South Bronx, as well as Park Slope and the Upper West Side and Bayside and Flushing. So um, it's all the more reason New York needs to lead here. So. I'm glad you're gonna have that report for us by the time we reconvene uh, for our preliminary budget hearing. I'm gonna take as hopeful and optimistic that you have hired that consultant, um, but uh, I just wanna be really clear, following the lead of those schools and suspending the test this year and using a one-year pro-diversity pro admission system would be a great down payment on making long delayed progress. Um, but if we come back with something that continues the test for next fall, and hopes to make progress beyond that, 
I just think it will be hard for anyone uh, to take Hunter's integrity to that work uh, very seriously. Thank you, Madam Chair, for this hearing, and thank you again to the students for their uh, for their courage and time and organizing. All right. Thank you all. Um, seeing as that we have no other council members waiting to ask questions, I will now turn it back to the chair for additional questions. Chair Barron. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I do have lots of questions and I'm going to just start by saying that, do you, do you see that there's a problem that there are so few students of color as well as low income students at Hunter College High School. Do you acknowledge that as a problem? Can you hear me, Madam Chair? Now I can, yes. Thank you. Um, I acknowledge that we have a lot of work to do at the campus schools. Oh, you don't think it's a problem? Besides the work, you don't think it's a problem? I think, no, I think, I think that we have some huge gaps, not only in our student body, but uh, in, in a lot of areas of the school as a whole. Um, so we have a lot of gaps. We are working on those uh, uh, specifically with respect to, you know, DEI initiatives. That includes not only admissions, uh, but it includes retention. It includes, you know, the curriculum. It includes the climate of the school. It includes, you know, includes faculty hiring. There are a lot of issues, a lot of places where we have gaps. And we acknowledge that. And we know that it's going to take a lot of work. We've already started doing a lot of work that I know hasn't been mentioned here. There's, as you mentioned, uh, Madam Chair, revolutions do not occur overnight. We have been doing a lot of work, particularly since I, since my arrival at the campus schools, which was only four years ago. Um, so between uh, doubling and in some areas, almost tripling uh, some of our, um, um, applications from underrepresented boroughs, right? From, um, uh, uh, so the Bronx and Staten Island, from charter school networks, uh, which used to be very low and in the last two, three years has uh, uh, more than doubled. So we've been doing a lot so far. So I don't wanna discount any of the work that we've already been doing and how it has led to at least making more Hunter more aware, um, excuse me, making those who are not as familiar with Hunter um, making, making them more aware of who we are and, and, and what we do. So we've been doing a lot, but we know that we still have more, uh, more to do. Um, and, and some of what we are still doing involves the task force. It's not limited to the task force, but it does involve the work of the task force. Where would you uh, rank the gap that exists in the uh, racial composition, the demographics of Hunt? Where, you said you have lots. Uh, and then there are many gaps. How would you prioritize the gap that exists in the student population at Hunter College High School? What does that fit in your list of um, things that have to be done? Uh, well, that's number one. It always has been number one on my list of things to be done as an admissions director. Um, oh. If, oh. if that's your question. That, that's my question, right? That's my question, uh, okay. In terms of uh, the models that we've talked about, what's the enrollment? I don't know if you had, if the data, if your report said that, what's the enrollment in all of the early college programs? I, Hunter's not an early college school, so I think no, Andrea has to, can, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, I, do, I don't have the uh, current school year's enrollment. I can follow up with you about that. Last year, we had a little over 9,000 students across all of 20 schools. Okay. So if I would like that, if you would disaggregate that for me uh, at the specialized high schools, the early college high schools, um, and how that trend has moved. Now, I heard you say that Mega Evers College is not an early college high school? That's correct. How does a college, how does a school become an early college high school? How do they get into that selection criteria? So the, the 20 schools in our portfolio were developed in collaboration with the DOE um, and 
their college partners to have that structured pathway to um, a Barron Associates degree or up to 60 credits. So there are many high schools across the city that offer the opportunity to take advanced courses and even college credit bearing courses that aren't part of the early college initiative. Okay, and I also would like if you would be able to um, give us the demographic makeup for the students who do earn college degrees. Uh, I think you gave us some of the stats about the students that earn it, but if you could give us a demographic breakdown of that as well. And in terms of students attending the early, the early college high schools, if a student doesn't want to, is it expected that all the students who enroll in that program will all take uh, classes that will give them the ability to have the additional two years beyond high school? Is that the expectation? And suppose if that requires additional time beyond the normal school day, uh, suppose students have other obligations that don't permit them to do that. So I wanna know, is there a differentiation in students' programs as they go to these early college high schools? There are probably many differentiations in programming across the 20 high schools that each of those 20 is focused on a core mission of every single student having the opportunity to begin college course taking while in high school and accumulate the, that up to 60 credits, regardless of what they, what level of education they enter with, right? So we have English language learners, we have students with IEPs, we have those students that I referred to are coming in at the lower end of eighth grade test scores. Um, and so there's a lot of differentiation that happens in terms of the academic supports um, and courses that students have access to to make sure that everybody is ready um, and has access to college courses usually beginning in about 10th grade um, for our six through 12 schools. So that can often happen beginning in ninth grade um, because some of that early preparation has happened earlier. The Academy for Careers in Television and Film, which CUNY college is partnered with that program? Uh, that's the Borough of Manhattan Community College. Do you know if they have any kind of uh, affiliation with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment? Um, I believe the school administration has worked with MOM in various ways over the years. I'd have to follow up with you to, to see what they were doing this year, if anything. Okay. Um, according to, well... I did ask you for a disaggregation of the degree and, and the affiliation, uh, the number of students rather, who are able to attain degrees, those who have um, just additional credits with not necessarily an associate's degree. And if you could remember to get that for us. And then in terms of the instructors, are there special qualifications that are necessary for teachers who are in the early college high schools? The high school teachers are licensed as high school teachers. Um, they are DOE employees. Um, the college courses are taught by um, CUNY adjuncts. In some cases, those are high school faculty who also qualify for and have applied to be adjunct, um, CUNY adjuncts, um, and might teach those courses. Um, in addition to, or you know, outside of their, their school day as high school teachers. So all of the teachers in, in the DOE buildings themselves are of course regular DOE certified and yes. the affiliation with the college are college instructors or adjuncts that are teaching that. Do students go to the college campus for those classes? Yes, um, it varies across the 20 schools and, and the course, right? But over the, their time at an individual high school, a student will probably do both, um, have some time on the campus of their college partner, as well as take courses in their high school that are taught by our college faculty. And those, is there an arrangement between the, uh, the unions regarding the affiliation or the relationship between the early college high school and the colleges themselves? Is there any kind of 
interaction between the unions, for example, is the affiliation or relationship between the UFT and the PSC? I'm not aware of any formal relationship between the two unions. Okay. And again, for the ECI schools, I would love to have a breakdown of the demographics of the teachers at the ECI schools, as well as at um, Hunter College High School and the Mega Evans School, which you say is not a part of the ECI, but we would like to get that information as well. And then um, I do have a question again regarding Hunter, no, Hunter College High School. And, and for the Hunter College High School, in terms of the teaching staff, are they DOE employees or are they CUNY employees? Whose payroll are they on? Which union uh, are they affiliated with for Hunter College High School? Can we unmute? Uh, I believe Sabra might be able to answer that. Yes. Can we unmute her? Um, Madam Chair, can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Um, what I, I, Madam Chair, as in my role as Director of Admissions, I would not have uh, specifics about our uh, faculty at Hunter College High School. Okay, well, if someone could uh, get that information, I would appreciate that. I'd like to know that. Uh, the last question I have is about the coursework itself. And it's particularly for um, the early college high schools. Do we have any idea of how many laptops DOE has lent to students, particularly in these early college high schools? Do we have any assurance that all of the students were able to receive those laptops? And what provisions were made based on the fact that they may have unreliable or unstable broadband uh, that's particularly for the early college high school programs. Yes, uh, so the, the laptop distribution is through the DOE. Uh, so we could follow up with you to get the exact statistics. Our, our principals across the 20 schools though, have worked very closely with all of their teachers to make sure students are have what they need to be successful this year. Um, they do a lot of individual follow-up with students um, and a lot of, of support um, and have worked to be very understanding of students who, um, who need extra technology or access to broadband. We can follow up with you um, uh, when regarding the numbers. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to acknowledge we've also been joined by Council Member Ulrich, who is a member of the committee as well. And Madam Moderator, I'll turn it back to you. I've concluded my questions and uh, turning it back to you. I do want to thank this panel for coming and for presenting the information. And you will receive written requests for the items that we've talked about. And we look forward to you getting them back to us. All right, thank you, Chair Barron. Um, we have concluded CUNY's testimony and will now turn to the rest of the public testimony. First, I'd like to remind everyone that I will call up individuals in panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms set, sets the clock and gives you a cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that it is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. And um, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. So the first panel of speakers will, in, and will be Rudmita Hassan, Mia Montrose, Brianna Gallimore, Annabelle Medina, and Charlotte Ritz-Jack. Uh, I will now call on Rumita Hassan to testify. Time starts now. My name is Rudmita Hassan and I am a current junior at Hunter College High School. In my five years at Hunter, I have found that the 2.4% Black, 6.2% Latinx, and 9% low-income student population maintained by the school often manifests and takes other forms in student life as unconscious biases and implicit assumptions outside of just being a few disheartening and depressing statistics. 
Not only does Hunter perpetuate an environment that promotes segregation between students, but they continue to promote educational experiences that are disparate, unequal, and incredibly isolating. My identity as a South Asian practicing Muslim at Hunter presents me at both ends of the spectrum. I'm an ethnic majority whilst remaining a religious minority. And while I have felt the harrowing political salience and accentuation of my religion through my friends, peers, teachers, and classes, it isn't anything compared to what I've seen some of the more prominent ethnically underrepresented minorities at school face. I have watched my own friends unconsciously create and take part in exerting a hostile environment for our underrepresented peers through niche statements, insensitive quips that were meant to be funny, and even casual actions that aren't meant to mean any harm. It is no lie that there is a general sense of ignorance and closed-mindedness among the Hunter student population and the Hunter community. And while no one is at direct fault, there is also no lie that the admissions process continues to encourage this. Hunter offers a variety of resources and opportunities for students, including a handful of cultural clubs that allow students to find comfort, seeking solace in their peers who come from similar ethnic and linguistic backgrounds. But a 40 minute meeting with kids of the same background, whether that be race or ethnicity, isn't enough because the issues lie within the community as a whole. While students may meet in this manner and express their sentiments with their friends who may have dealt with similar experiences in the Hunter community, this is a conversation that regards, that regards the entire Hunter population. It is not fair that these students are being forced to pick up the pieces and deal with the collateral damage of the pressing issues and experiences they are put through because of our community, whether unconscious or not. We are asking that you hear us and see the reverse effects of your efforts in composing and polishing the Hunter population. While students may be surrounded by individuals who are bright, talented, and challenge them to do better, they're also being denied the useful cultural sensitivity, empathy, and self-awareness that will aid them through an exponentially diverse future to come. It is important that CUNY and Hunter recognize the necessity of increased diversity and publicly commit to reforming the admissions process. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Mia Montrose. Time starts now. I actually believe that Clementine Roach was supposed to be on that list and go before me. Hello, sorry. Um... Time starts now. Hi, my name is Clementine and I'm a senior at Hunter College High School. I'm here to talk about the way Hunter's current admission system disproportionately benefits students who have the ability to pay for test prep, disadvantaging low-income students. Our teachers who write the test have earlier clearly highlighted the faults with the current process of a single high-stakes test. However, many who recognize these flaws still point to the way test prep gives bright students the training they need to take the test and get in. They ask why, instead of making all these changes to the process, can't we just create opportunities for test prep for low-income students? Years of attempts by alums and our administration to increase free test prep for, for prospective seventh graders has shown that this is an ineffective solution for a number of reasons. First, whether or not it is free, many low-income students will not have the time to do test prep as they must work or help take care of families. Second, even if these programs are well run, they will never have the resources or staff of businesses that charge thousands of dollars. Rather than giving disadvantaged students a leg up, it would just turn the test into a war over who has access to the best prep. People who can afford it will always be able to pay for more expensive prep and have the connections to beat the system. In 2020, Hunter tried to increase free test prep and it did not bring in a single student. Furthermore, if we recognize that test prep is a large factor of being able to get in, then we are also recognizing that many of the student, students Hunter admits are students with most prep rather than the most overall high achieving and brightest student. An HCHS administrator has even admitted to the assumption that every student who goes to Hunter takes prep. This is an evidence of a flaw with the system. Within Hunter, critical thinking and complex and thorough understanding of material is valued highly as opposed to rote memorization and cramming without really understanding the mechanics of a subject. Shouldn't we want our admissions process to reflect these values? Not only does a reliance on test prep demonstrate the flaws of the test and its misalignment with Hunter's mission and values, it also divests from actual educational programs to help low-income students. By focusing resources on test prep for underprivileged students, we are ignoring the fact that they may not have the same grounding in certain fundamental skills because of disparities in earlier education. 
Money could instead, for example, be used for a summer program that helps incoming students with less resources prepare for seventh grade rather than preparing for them for a test. Beyond any debate over the efficacy of test prep, the relationship between private test prep businesses and HCHS, a public high school, is problematic. HCHS for Diversity recently held a press conference that's been talked about a lot in this hearing with Councilmember Inez Barron after 37 electo elected officials signed a letter addressed to the Hunter administration urging this year's test to develop uh, equitable admissions alternatives, or this test to be suspended and develop all, all admissions alternatives. In retaliation, Queller Test Prep, a service used by many who prepare for the Hunter test, wrote a reactionary email to everybody on their mailing list. We have submitted the full email, which can be found as the 25th document in our written testimony, pages 147 to 76. Uh, can I continue, please? Yes, you may. Uh, thank you. Uh, but in short, it was a fear-mongering call to action, which showed an image of HCHS for diversity's faces, which included multiple minors, and then attacked our ideas, including personal attacks on council member Brad Lander and his daughter. It should be disturbing to see a private for-profit business attempting to influence the admissions process of a public high school. While the email attempts to push responsibility for change onto early education rather than HCHS, it is clear this is an email created by a business desperate not to lose money. Queller Prep is charging $3,900 for Zoom courses and $4,500 for in-person classes this summer. In Queller's About Us page, Hunter is the first school they mention. If the test were to be changed or removed, Queller could lose a lot of money. We do not want, uh, private businesses should not have an influence over New York City students' education. We do not want to build up a flawed system. We want to reform the current one or create a new one that will bring in high achieving students from all over the city, not just the ones who have $4,000 to spend on prep. Thank you. Thank you, Clementine, for your testimony. We will now turn to Mia Montrose. Time starts now. Thank you. So good afternoon, my name is Mia Montrose and I'm a junior at Hunter College High School. As a black student, every day is a reminder that our student body does not represent the entirety of New York City's academic talent. I'm constantly faced with the question of whether or not I belong here. I started in an elementary school surrounded by people that looked like me, where my culture was celebrated and shared. My Caribbean roots grew to become a defining part of my identity, but that part of me is lost inside Hunter's walls. In fact, I still look to my old elementary school friends for a space where I can be myself, because I only need one hand to count the amount of people at Hunter with a similar cultural identity. Because the majority of my peers come from similar backgrounds, I often have difficulty partaking in class discussions because of the feeling that everything I say will be wrong simply because it's different. It, will, it was only until this year in English class when we started reading one of Zora Neale Hurston's novels that I felt that I could add to the conversation only because I saw myself in her work. Even then, I felt like my experience was overlooked by other students. Plainly put, being a part of the minority at Hunter has been isolating and damaging, but this lack of diversity is hurting all of Hunter students. Underrepresented populations are not reaching their full social, emotional, or academic potential, and the rest of our peers aren't being exposed to the different perspectives, cultures, or realities of an extremely diverse city. This is a direct outcome of Hunter's sole reliance on a single high stakes admissions exam. The Hunter test has proved itself to fail students at underfunded and understaffed schools and to overlook the implications of New York City's segregated school system. This is important to recognize, especially as we consider what this means for the students across our city that have received disparate and unequal educational opportunities after school shut down last spring. As a city, we have seen how the pandemic has disproportionately affected low income families and families of color. An admissions process that considers a student's background or educational hardships must replace Hunter's current process if we truly want to recognize and support the academic talent from our city's most vulnerable New Yorkers. While the Hunter test has only been postponed, not canceled, competitive exam schools across the country have suspended their single high stakes admissions exams, as council, as council member Lander stated, for 2021, and have implemented systems that aim to consider the effects of the pandemic while still admitting a diverse, high achieving class. Excellence lies in equity. 
Hunter College High School has the opportunity to follow this lead, given that the school is not restricted by Hecht Calandra. We have the freedom to experiment with our admissions process and implement an equitable process for the 2021 admission cycle. We understand that any substantive way requires time and money. Time expired. May I continue? Thank you. Um, we understand that any substantive way forward requires time and money, but proactivity and intention are even more conducive to progress. Hunter College High School is a remarkable place, but we will continue to hold our administration accountable to creating a school that admits students equitably, and that is a place where students like me and all those who spoke before me can tr truly thrive. Referencing the second document of our submitted written, written testimony found on pages two through five, we have known that this test is not an accurate measure of academic talent or potential, but an indicator of socioeconomic and situational privilege for 20 years. The educational disparities across New York City have existed long before 2020, but the pandemic has served to bring them into our public consciousness. This is an opportunity to examine all the ways in which not only our city's elite high schools, but our entire education system fails underrepresented students. The Hunter administration is not exempt from this. We need commitment and we need reform. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mia. I will now call on Brianna Gallimore. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chair Barron, for the opportunity to testify today. And, and thank you to the Hunter College High School students for their continued leadership and advocacy. Please know that you have the support of the HSAS students on this call. My, my name is Brianna Gallimore, and I'm a junior at the High School of American Studies and a member of the HSAS Committee for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. On my first day at HSAS, I was told that I got lucky. As one of only four black students in my grade, I immediately felt out of place. I took the SHSAT with no prep and scored only one point above the cutoff. I can say no more than I got lucky. I got lucky, but the education of black and brown students should not be based on luck. We should not have to feel like outsiders in our own school. For many black students like myself, choosing a high school makes, make, means making a choice between an inclusive environment and a quality education, a choice that no student should have to make. Admissions to specialized high schools are held under lock and key, only accessible to those who can afford thousands of dollars in test prep. Factors such as access to resources and an alienating cur curriculum increase socioeconomic tensions and end up targeting low-income students, many of whom are Black and Latinx, therefore limiting their access to these specialized high schools. We have certainly felt the effects of these inequities at HSAS. When the school was founded in 2002 until around 2012, HSAS had a diverse student body with about a fourth of each race being represented. But since then, its demographics have shifted. According to the city council's own data, today the school is only 5% Black and around 14% Latinx. This is completely different from the demographics of Lehman College, our CUNY host, which is around 53% Hispanic and 30% Black. There's a large discrepancy between CUNY schools like Lehman, which tend to be very diverse, and representative of the community, communities that they serve versus HSAS, although being on the same campus is not nearly as representative of the diversity in the Bronx or the diversity in New York City as a whole. In keeping with our current admission system, there's only one other method that would immediately, immediately increase the diversity in our school. The discovery program, which gives disadvantaged students who scored just below the SHSAT cutoff score an opportunity to attend HSAS. Through the discovery program, we have seen an increase in diversity and we hope to expand the program soon. Right now, I go to a high school that is incredibly racially, ethnically, and socioeconomically homogenous, and I have experienced the detrimental effects of such, lack, of such a lack of diversity. While students have taken it upon themselves to try to rectify this problem, it is not a fight that we can undertake on our own. We need, we need help from legislators like yourselves. I implore you to take note of the personal accounts given today and commit to diversity, equity, and inclusion in our school. A student should never be forced to choose between a diverse environment and I'm a quality inspired. education. You may continue. Thank you. Quality education does not exist without diversity. 
Thank you for your testimony, Brianna. I will now be calling on Annabelle Medina. Time starts now. My name is Annabelle Medina and I go to the High School of American Studies. I wanna thank the council and Chair Barron for the opportunity to testify. I started at HSAS in the fall of 2017. Transitioning into high school is objectively challenging for any student, but the way in which my experience was difficult felt unique from that of my peers. The District 10 middle school I went to was a safe space for me. In the classroom, I heard from different, I heard from students of different socioeconomic and ethnic backgrounds. At the same time, I had the security of knowing my culture was represented as well. This combination ensured that I felt respected and appreciated. Because I was a preteen, I had no idea that what I was truly feeling was the larger positive impact of attending a diverse institution. This experience was one I thought would stick with me throughout my high school years while going to a school in the Bronx. However, at HSAS, I felt incredibly isolated despite attending a school in District 10 whose campus is surrounded by people of color. When I would walk into the Lehman College cafeteria to buy lunch, I saw almost exclusively black and Hispanic college students as one would imagine in Bedford Park. But when I would return from lunch, I struggled to even find another Hispanic student in the classroom and almost never had any classes with black students as there were only four in our entire grade. My high school experience was supposed to be defined by normal teenage activities, but the two things I will remember most are the isolation I felt and the work I did to combat that feeling. Organizing with my peers, some of whom are testifying today, we created the Committee for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion to provide a safe space for students of color at HSAS. In addition, we launched a campaign to advocate for expanding the discovery program to 33%, which helps HSAS bring in more students of color from the Bronx. During the campaign, we spent our entire summer meeting with elected officials to pressure the Department of Education to use the power that they have within the state law to increase diversity at our school. Since representatives from the year, we have been reluctant to embrace this necessary measure. I urge the council to compose and sign on to a resolution directed at Chancellor Carranza requesting he increase the discovery program to 33% or to work with us in order to take other appropriate action. However, we are aware that discovery is just a temporary solution to the structural inequity within that specialized high school admissions process. This is why I also urge the council to adopt resolution 1401, calling for the state legislature and governor to repeal Hector Calandra, giving New York City the power to reform our own admissions processes. Although all of the work that we, as high schoolers, have done to foster diversity has been incredibly empowering, the truth is that it is unfair we were forced to take on this task in the first place. It is unjust that those who have been harmed most by the lack of diversity are the ones who must work to solve the issues that our current system created. Due to the pandemic, the HSAS class of 25 is especially at risk to be one of the least diverse classes yet. Because of school closures, District 10 middle school students may have had may have been less prepared to take the specialized admissions test. Um, may I continue, please? Yes, you may. Thank you. District 10 middle school students may have been less prepared to take the specialized high school admissions test and possibly not even aware that the test exists. This makes your support in urging the Department of Education to increase the discovery program and the state to repeal Hector Calandra by adopting resolution 1401 all the more necessary. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Annabelle. Uh, I will now call on Charlotte Ritz-Jack. Time starts now. Good morning and thank you to Chair Barron for her leadership on this incredibly important issue. My name is Charlotte Rich-Jack and I am a senior at the High School of American Studies at Lehman College or HSAS and a leader of the HSAS Committee for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. For almost nine months, our school has tirelessly fought to expand the percentage of students admitted through the discovery program to one third of each incoming class. While the HSAS community overwhelmingly supports this proposal, our advocacy work has been led by students. We are directly impacted by education public policy, and we know this change will create a better social and academic experience for all members of our community. In the status quo, with Heck Calandra still in place, the discovery program is our only method of increasing diversity at our school. The percentage of discovery program admits allotted to each specialized high school is decided by the chancellor. Our advocacy has all revolved around urging Chancellor Carranza to expand the discovery program because the discovery program works. Our proportion of white and wealthy students, which is uniquely very high at HSAS and among the greatest across city schools, has gone down at the same proportion for which discovery program admits have increased. This year, the freshman class is 50% white, the lowest it has been since 2012 when our demographics began to shift. 
and 20% of students were accepted through the discovery program, the highest proportion in HSAS history. Our freshman class looks a lot different than our senior class, which was only 6% discovery students. Action is even more desperately needed now, as we could have our least diverse year yet. This year, the DOE administered the SHSAT on short notice as the, as the pandemic continued to ravage our city. Many students unable to access tutoring and without adequate time to prepare were living in neighborhoods, like many in the Bronx where schools are located, painfully impacted by COVID to an inequitable proportion simply did not sit for the exam this year. The COVID-19 crisis has put many New York City middle school students in unimaginably hard situations. This testing cycle favors privileged white students more than any other group. An expansion of the discovery program is direly needed. We have met with over 20 elected officials requesting that they advocate on our behalf with the chancellor. Additionally, nearly 100 members of our own community, parents, alums, teachers, and current students, have emailed Chancellor Carranza requesting an expansion of the discovery program beginning in the 2021 to 2020 school, school cycle and moving forward. Chancellor Carranza has overwhelmingly withheld a response, declining opportunities to work together and make this change a reality. He has responded with just one state senator's advocacy, despite the hundreds of letters, and cited the Krista McAuliffe Intermediate School PTO's lawsuit of expired relevance as the DOE's reasoning for not acting on a proposal. The Krista McAuliffe Intermediate School PTO versus Bill de Blasio was filed in early 2019, when de Blasio and Carranza announced an increase in the, of the discovery program to 20%. The federal suit argues an expansion of the discovery program constitutes as racial discrimination against Asian Americans and is thus a violation of the 14th Amendment. However, the suit has no impact on the expansion of the discovery program at HSAS, as the PTO requested a, pre a preliminary injunction alongside their filing of a suit, asking any changes to the discovery program be halted until the suit is Time expired. May I continue? Yes, this you request, may. Thank you. Um, this request was denied on February 25th of 2019 by federal judge Eduardo Ramos on the basis that the suit was, quote, not likely to succeed on their equal protection claim. In other words, the decision was made because the court found the case unlikely to prevail. Krista McAuliffe then appealed the decision, and on December 20th of 2019, the United States Court of Appeals withheld the decision, with, upheld the decision to reject the preliminary injunction. Additionally, Bronx Science alum Claude M. Millen filed a lawsuit with the New York State Education Department when the 20% expansion of the discovery program was mandated. The case was dismissed on August um, 29th of 2019. The decision reads, quote, I cannot conclude that respondents' ex expansion and modification of the discovery program was unlawful, arbitrary, or capricious. These suits have been rejected by judges and have no legal implications for the expansion of the discovery program. So today we are here in front of the city council asking for movement to the members of the higher education committee and other members of the council committed to integration and persuaded of diversity's infinite benefits. Action can come in the composition and a signature on a resolution directed at Chancellor Kwanzaa requesting he implement our school's proposal to expand the discovery program as submitted in June of 2020. But advocacy doesn't end there. We urge the city's leaders to listen and truly commit to holistically creating an equitable system of education because that's where excellent li excellence lies. Our school, its students, teachers, and faculty will thank you as will the legacy of the city as elected representation taking a stand to move our abhorrently segregated reality towards a future that pr prioritizes opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Charlotte. Um, before I turn to Chair Barron for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate they have a question for the panel. Um, and I'll turn it to Chair Barron for her questions. Thank you very much. I want to thank the panel for coming. And uh, I, I do want to acknowledge that our second panel, the CUNY panel, has remained, and I'm grateful for that, so that they can hear directly from the students what it is that their concerns are. In terms of, I particularly want to give some time to the students from the High School for American Studies, because we haven't heard from them uh, previously uh, during this hearing. In terms of what you're experiencing at your school, how what has been the um, position of the administration? What has been the opportunity to be able to say, uh, we're not bound by Hecht Calendra, only those three schools are. So what has been the efforts uh, of the administration to look at, do they see this as a challenge or as a gap? And what has been their response in trying to address that issue? Have they met with you? Have they had conversation? Are there any kinds of initiatives or uh, student meetings that are held that allow students to dialogue and to talk about what might be those unconscious biases? What's been your experience with the administration at your school? 
Um, yeah, so our administration is completely supportive of expanding the discovery program. They submitted the proposal to the DOE in June of 2020. It's um, submitted with our written testimony to the council as well. Um, and it was submitted not only with the principal and vice principal support, but with every faculty member um, at our high school. Uh, and unfortunately, we are bound by Heck Calandra. When our school was mandated a specialized high school, we were immediately added to the law. Um, so we will have to wait until it is either repealed or something else happens um, to have some wider systemic reform. So the Hecht Calandra, you're saying, extends beyond just Stuyvesant Tech and the Brooklyn College, uh, Brooklyn Tech, Stuyvesant, and Bronx. But in fact, okay. Uh, so what has been your experience as students then uh, to mobilize, and we appreciate the fact that you're in that leadership and taking on that struggle to be able to, to make that difference. But what do you see as the, you talked about the discovery program and the benefits from that. Has that been something that has been uh, going on the incline? What's been the trend in terms of the uh, discovery program? Um, yeah, so basically, um, like you said, we all mobilized over the summer, um, beginning with sort of like a letter um, that circulated around our school um, that had the support of different staff members, of students, of parents and alum, um, where we essentially started the initiative to expand diversity within HSAS. Um, and like I want to say, Brianna mentioned in her testimony before, discovery program, that it is the only way right now that we can expand diversity and it is the one thing that we can advocate for within our city because we are bound to HECT. Um, so a lot of our focus has gone to trying to expand this program to 33%. Um, so over the summer, like we had mentioned before, um, we met with different elected officials in order to um, sort of try and lobby the chancellor to increase that. Um, as mentioned before, he did increase it to 20% a few years ago, but at our school, we just have such a unique proportion of white students that the 20% is not enough for our school. We need more than that. And because our school is so small, I wanna say about a hundred kids per grade, each and every percentage represents one student who could be coming in through discovery. So that like every single percentage matters a lot for our school and it is like imperative that we are able to expand this program because that is right now the most we can do besides campaigning to repeal Hector Glandra. Well, I wanna thank you for coming and sharing your testimony. And I just want to make sure that you're aware that many instances, it was the student population that brought about change. Uh, we can look back to the struggle of the civil rights movement. We can look across other countries, other nations. It's that population of students that are fighting for CUNY and CUNY itself it was that population of students in the uh, 60s that fought to have the black studies program that fought to have open admissions. And it's, uh, I guess that that urge and that vibrancy and that youthfulness and that a quest for doing what's right, what's just, and what's equitable that in fact serves as an impetus to get you to move. So I just want to say that I support you, I commend you, and look forward to your ongoing efforts. And in any way that I can continue to work with you and advance your cause, I'm glad to do that. So please just make sure you reach out to me and we can stay in touch as we move forward and share ideas to, to shake this system to break up this concrete that uh, has so many institutions embedded in it and doesn't want to let it loose. But thank you so much for your testimony. Madam moderator. Thank you, Chair Barron. Seeing as there don't appear to be any more council members with questions, I can turn it back to you if you have any additional questions or we can go on to the next panel. We can move to the next panel, thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. In our next panel, we will have, we have, I'm pardon, Asam Sharif Alden. Asam, if you're available. 
Time starts now. Hello. Uh, hello, my name is Assam Sharif Alden, and I'm a first generation immigrant. My parents were both raised in Yemen, and I was, I went there for two years of my life. I'm a New York City native. Um, and I grew up in Flappers, Brooklyn. As a student at the Macaulay Honors College at CUNY Hunter, I've rarely felt at home. To say the least, the Honors College is disproportionately white, as always made me feel alienated, especially during the required seminars that were made for the sole purpose of creating a sense of community. There's this pressure to assimilate and oftentimes requires me to compromise my own unique personality that got me here in the first place. Watching groups of white or white passing people migrate create a sense of exclusivity by only socializing amongst themselves, while I had to struggle to find familiar faces for my own sense of community, just never sat right with me. While this is just a personal anecdote, I've bonded with many people of color in the same honors college in grades above, below, and in other CUNY campuses. Part of the admissions process for the Macaulay Honors College for the class of 2022 is to respond to a prompt describing why you love NYC. And it is sad to say that the people who uphold this very culture that we praise and love are underrepresented and struggle to find those same principles within the Honors College. While CUNY is the college of the proletariat, it's Honors College is definitely not. Thank you. Do you have more? Uh, you're muted. You're mute. Okay. You're muted again. Yeah, I'm saying no, that, that is it, that is it, that's all. Okay, oh, that's it. Okay, great, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, are there other members of this panel, Madam Moderator? There aren't any logged in currently. I think there were a few that we're hoping to get in around 1230, but I don't know if we'll be, might be concluded by that time. But if you have any questions, yes. Ask. Uh, thank you so much for, for participating in our hearing. And uh, you talk about a program that we had not previously discussed at length. They were in my opening remarks, but we had not discussed them at length. The Macaulay Honors Program. How does someone get into the Macaulay Honors Program? Sarah Falden, can you yeah. 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 Uh, So the admissions process just requires you to have a specific GPA and uh, you'd have to write to, you have to respond to two essay prompts and you'd uh, have to go through a series of interviews, like I think one interview. I think it might differ depending on the community campus you're applying to, but for Hunter College specifically, I went through one interview and I had to send in two essays. And in, ter in terms of your participation at Hunter. Do you select the school that you want to attend? Do you select the program through the school or do you have the program? Uh, how does that work? If so you, you, had select, you select the, the CUNY campus you'd wanna to attend to and then you apply from Macaulay to that campus. But the application process is, is the same, but the interview itself might be dependent on the CUNY you're applying to. Cause I know uh, other friends in other campuses that didn't have to go through an interview. Oh, so each campus may have its own uh, requirements for admission. Yeah, but the, but the the uh, the essays, the prompts are common throughout. It's interesting. I thought I heard you say that the prompt was why I love New York City. Is that what you said? Yeah, that was from the class of 2022. We'd have to we, one of the prompts is to respond to. That's like, a very what about New York City that you love the culture, whatever it is. That's a very presumptuous topic heading, uh, very perhaps limiting rather than being more open and inviting another kind of perspective. And uh, I, I don't know who proposes those questions, but rather than saying, how, what do you feel about New York City? You know, to say why you love New York City, it assumes that you're here and that you have had all kinds of positive experiences. So that's an interesting, uh, topic. In terms of the Macaulay Honors Program, you're you're in Hunter. Yes. What are the who are the other students that are in Hunter in that Macaulay Honors Program, and how do you interact with them? Do yeah. you have classes together? Do you travel together? So one one uh, so 
a lot, a, a huge chunk of people within my grade specifically come from Staten Island, Staten Island Tech to, to be exact. And the majority of them are, are either white or white passing. And there's like this, like look, almost like a cult. I don't, I don't mean to point fingers or anything, but it's like you seeing people like have this bit, like striking sense of exclusivity. And it's just like, it makes you, it's like I have to put in the work in order to actually assimilate and compromise my personality in the process. And uh, you also find people from Long Island, like not, not like the majority of the people that I've interacted with are not even from NYC itself. They're like either Long Island or, uh, I mean, Staten Island is part of the five boroughs, but it's, a, it's its own anomaly. So do you feel that there are any kind of opportunities for you to share your cultural experiences and have them acknowledged or have them uh, a part of the conversation? Are there groups, sessions where particularly the Macaulay Honors students come together to uh, interact as a group? Yes, uh, so the college itself has these required seminars and there's four of them and uh, they were made for the sole purpose of assimilate, like creating a sense of community for these students. And the only problem is that there's, there's no one, I mean, it's, it's hard to find people to share, that share your same experience, like with, uh, within the college. So while there are these seminars, like it's, it's, it's not enough. Um, I think that it's interesting because for me, I don't see education as, as the um, platform to require someone to be so-called assimilated in terms of blending in. I, I much more think that it's a matter of acknowledging and sharing. And I, I think back to, uh, I would, I've been reading recently about, there was a person, a woman highlighted in Google, who was a Native American, and she talked about her experience. I think her last name was Sa, S-A. And she talked about her experiences and how when she went to the educational system uh, on, on the reservation, she was assimilated and lost her identity and lost a part of her culture. And so I'm always, wondering when people say assimilated, do they mean that they're giving up or they need to, uh, she talked about the fact that they cut her long hair, which was a sign of her culture and she dressed differently. So are we talking about that kind of requirement that people deny or not acknowledge or not uh, be proud of their own cultural differences as assimilation? Or are we talking about the opportunity to share your culture, your hairstyle, your clothing, uh, your manner of dress in a way that people can become educated as to what your own groups have contributed or how they just have their cultural expressions. So I I'm concerned that we not see assimilation as, as being giving up so that you can be a part of the group, but being able to share your own specific cultural differences and have them not diminished or neglected or pushed aside, but acknowledged. So I don't know how you feel about that assimilation. You know, I mean, ideally we'd like to share our culture and not, not just compromise in the process, mm -hmm. but I think CUNY should do more or Macaulay Honors should do more in that, in that context in order to help the students that are not necessarily white people of color within the college. And, and the other thing that I just want to say is that for me, it's not about having, uh, not about having to move from our own environments and our own cultures into the dominant, in terms of the number of students in the, in the program, white population, but simply the fact that the racism and the, histem the systemic differences and disparity have poured the resources into these kinds of programs that give them uh, more of an opportunity that have 
other kinds of educational supports that are available that make them more attractive than perhaps other schools that don't have those tangible material resources. But for me, it's not about integrating to be in that so-called white group or that white environment, that privileged group, but simply not being denied the opportunity to take advantage of that. So uh, I'm very leery also when people say integrate as if to say that's the, uh, the body that in fact has the more advantageous kinds of circumstances. No one told me I've been muted. I don't know for how long. <laughs> just a few seconds. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to share that. Um, and thank you for coming and sharing your testimony. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Moderator. Thank you, Chair. We've actually been joined by another panelist. So I will now take the time to call Diana Kennedy to testify. Time starts now. Hi, um, and thank you all for allowing me to come into this space uh, to uh, give my testimony. Um, so as a Macaulay Honors student, I am actually one of, I think approximately 10 black students in my graduating class at Hunter College. Um, we have well over a hundred students in the program, the majority of which at Hunter are white and um, Asian. And when I first arrived to the college, I because it was a CUNY institution, I assumed that it would be diverse and that I would be interacting with students who looked like me on a daily basis. But what I found was that the Macaulay Honors Program within Hunter was not representative of all at all of the overall um, student population at Hunter College. Um, and as a new student who was really new to being in such an academically rigorous program, I felt that being the few one of the few students of color um, I was more prone to falling into the imposter syndrome um, and stuff like that. So I felt it was very difficult for me at first to felt as if I belonged within this program. Um, additionally, like Asa mentioned before, we do have these Macaulay seminars in which we are meant to forge a sort of community with our fellow students. Um, and some of these seminars are actually focused on the history of New York City and the people within uh, the city. Um, however, these seminars don't really emphasize the black experience I felt in the way that they should. And all the seminar professors that I've had um, since freshman year were either Asian or white. Um, and so it made sort of conversations about, for example, police brutality um, and issues within the black community sort of uncomfortable to have in that setting. Um, I remember in one of the seminars that I had, we were discussing um, broken windows policing um, and also racial profiling. Um, and because I was one of the few, or actually the only black student in the class, uh, the professor would often, I guess, inadvertently use me as an example for certain things. So for example, he would say, uh, in an instance of racial profiling, someone who looks like Diana, for example, would be stopped um, and not someone who looks like me, referring to himself, who was a white male teacher. Um, and so at the time, I tend to let things roll off my back and not really take them too personally, but I spoke to the professor and I told him, you know, am I the only, your only example that you're using in class because I'm the only student of color here, the only black student. Um, and so obviously he was a little bit embarrassed and became very flustered, but then I realized that it's because Macaulay is structured in a way in which students like me are not really present in a classroom. So when we're having discussions about the black community or about policing or police violence, um, it's, it's sort of difficult to have really an open dialogue with people that don't necessarily understand the issues that they're talking about. Time expired. Uh, and you might continue. thank you so much. Yes, okay. Um, and I'm also part of Macaulay Diversity Initiative, which is a student group which advocates for um, students of color within uh, Macaulay Honors College. And recently we had a Zoom attack for one of our Black History Month events. And it took Dean Pearl approximately more, a little more than a week to respond to the attack that had happened. In the meantime, a bunch of other student groups um, showed out in solidarity for us. And I feel that Macaulay doesn't support students like myself in the way that they should. Um, and the environment that's created 
though not intentionally hostile, can definitely come off as so um, because there's so little students of color present. Um, thank you. That is all I have to say for that. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, sorry, dear. That's okay. Thank you so much for you, for your um, testimony. It's always most important to hear directly from those who are impacted by the issues that we're discussing. And it highlights for me that uh, there are still those who are charged with perhaps being sensitive and leading sessions that are supposed to bring some type of sensitivity who themselves have not been adequately prepared to do an analysis of, analysis of their own uh, perhaps unconscious bias or insensitivity uh, to highlight or, or someone who looks like a person in the class rather than talking generically, not being aware that there might be that level of sensitivity or uncomfortableness. Uh, I hope that he did apologize publicly since he made the statement publicly. Did he? Diana? Yes, yes, he did apologize at the end of class. Okay. Well, that's good. That, that's uh, some acknowledgement that came there. But it also says to me then that as Macaulay is in fact structuring these seminars with the intent of creating a sense of uh, equity and understanding that they need to be very, very focused and very uh, demonstrative in their, in their presentation of being inclusive because it appears to me that they're not being inclusive. And that's traditional, that's historic. You know, the people are still talking about Christopher Columbus discovered America when that's not factually true. And people are still talking about the fact that African-Americans uh, were enslaved and were very docile and that's not true. There's a whole period of resistance. So we've got to, there's a lot that we have to do to try to correct the historical errors and lies that are incorporated and to look how we can bring that forward and make ourselves better people as we look at all of the members of our society. Uh, but I thank you for coming and I thank you for your testimony. Yes, Madam, thank you so much. Thank you. Madam moderator. Thank you, Chair Barron. I believe we've been joined by our final panelist. Um, I believe this is Matthew Barron, but please note that your name is listed as Asam Sharafaldin. So if you could just provide us your name for the record and then if you feel, please testify. Time starts now. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Matthew Barron, as stated. I don't know why it's showing up as Asam Sharafaldin, but um, yeah, I'm a junior in Macaulay and sort of like I haven't faced a specific microaggression similar to Diana. However, I was really disappointed coming into the CUNY system as a student at one of at one of New York City's prestigious high schools, the specialized high school program. It, it was like the same thing. All of the students there were also white and there was like a lack of representation there and students would just say like, like remarks that were not very that 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 would not really like I don't know just like um, show the representation and they 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 would uh, uh, say things about like like me being the only black person in school and I thought that going to the CUNY system known for its diversity in in its prestigious program I would be able to escape from that but. Uh, as was as with like their high school, the prestigious high school program in New York City, the prestigious college program in New York City is also very white as well. And I know it's a lot of the same patterns like uh, black students being excluded from social gatherings, like parties where most of the majority of the white students would be, but then the black students uh, wouldn't be invited. And it, it's, I don't think, I don't think it's, 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 it's it's it was meant to be malicious but it definitely did come off in that way considering that not only were there like parties and other social gatherings but even like around the campus like it, white students generally feel like less comfortable to talk to me than other white students i've noticed which like it, it, it lowers as like a black student 
it lowers your confidence and you can sort of feel like a pariah in the school even even though it's not your fault people just don't really understand your culture and 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 they don't take the time to learn there's there's like other black students i've seen in, in our grade who've been like completely like excluded from like the grade as a whole like they 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 were never included in any like social events at all and it's 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 typical to see that like in the macaulay like community within the cohort and just like that that it makes sense that that would happen in any group of like like uh or any group or any community that that isn't diverse and only has a, a, a large majority of one group of people thank you thank you for your testimony thank chair you. do you have any questions yes thank you uh glad again for your coming and sharing your testimony and i think that we're going to have to have a a look at the Macaulay Honors Program and perhaps not in the format of a hearing uh, per se, but looking at that program and having some dialogue with CUNY to have some improvements there and some uh, examination of what is actually happening so that we can see what can be done to reduce this sense of isolation or the projection of feeling less than and, and be very targeted in giving the support and encouragement to those students, Black students in particular, who are not represented uh, in sufficient numbers to let them know that they are valued, that they are important, and that they matter. Thank you so much for your testimony. And Madam Moderator, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Thank you, Chair Barron. We have now heard from everyone that has signed up to testify. Uh, we appreciate your time and presence. If we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the raised hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you in the order of hands raised. I'm going to give everybody a minute to raise hands. Seeing no one else, I would like to note that written testimony, which will be reviewed in full by committee staff, may be submitted to the record up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing by emailing to it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, Chair Barron, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Thank you so much. And I just have to say to our new counsel, Amy Briggs, you did a fantastic job. You did it with ease. You didn't get <laughs> really great. So I want to commend you for how well you did on your maiden uh, voyage here. Thank you so much. And with that, I want to thank all of the panelists. Thank all of you for your testimony. And we've got to make CUNY better. You know, it's where it is, but we've got to make CUNY better in so many aspects of what it uh, has to offer in making sure that we get that equity. I'm a CUNY alum, Hunter, class January 1967. And if it were not for CUNY, were not for CUNY I know that my life would have taken a very different kind of turn. So I uh, want to make sure that we can make CUNY better and work in that regard. Thank you to all the students. We're living in very difficult times, a time that none of us has ever lived through before in terms of this pandemic. But I want to encourage you and say, be encouraged, don't give up, you know, find some kind of inner strength, find someone else that you can relate to that can help give you that boost. And my office is always available. Please make sure you reach out should we be able to help you in any regard. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. I'm gonna use my shake away, <laughs> and I declare that this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.